Hey, it's Pastor Mike. Before you start today's episode, I want to tell you about my current sermon series called Trends Versus Truth. Now, when something trends, it feels true. You hear it enough from enough people you respect and you assume it has to be true, but just because something sounds right doesn't mean it is right. So what does God have to say about some of the most trendy statements of our time and culture? In this series, we're going to look at five of them. God told me, be you, love is love, who am I to judge, and practice self-care. Oh, this is one of my favorite series of the whole year. I hope you can check it out by looking up Time of Grace with Pastor Mike Novotny wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And of course, you can always watch this series on timeofgrace.org. Are you responsible for their sin? Recently at our church's Q&A Sunday, a mother typed in that question. Are we responsible for other people's sins? For example, my daughter is living with her boyfriend. Hmm. You ever thought about that? Obviously, sin happens all around us. All have sinned, all do sin. Your best friend sins, your little brother sins, your older sister sins, your mom and dad sin. If you have kids, they sin too. Your pastor sins. Everyone sins. There's sin happening in the world. There's sin happening in the church. So are you responsible for that? Are you responsible to say something, to do something, to act upon it? I think that would be a full-time job, <laughs> addressing every sin. So what, what exactly does the Bible say about your responsibility for someone else's behavior? Man, this is something I would say our modern culture knows nothing about and we are struggling. On the one hand, we live in this world that says just live your truth and you do you and who am I to judge and no one's perfect. Like I have nothing to do with you. And then, and then we find out sins are happening within a church or at a business and no one said anything. They enabled it. They allowed it. We say, well, that's bad. Right? Have you been caught in the middle of this? Do I say something? Do I not? I mean, I'm a sinner. Should I, I judge the situation or should I not? I don't agree with that behavior. Is it my point to say something, to make a scene, to confront and cause a conflict? Or should I just step back and let God be the judge because he's the only one who can do it well? Hmm. Good question. The Bible actually has a very clear answer. I love what the Apostle Paul said to the church in Corinth. There was a horrible example of sin happening within the church. There was an example of incest where a man was sleeping with his father's wife. Seems like his stepmom. And the Corinthians didn't feel like it was their place to judge. Like they were turning a blind eye. You know, we're just this loving community who's not going to talk about that. Oh, wow. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The apostle Paul came with fire. He was, he was mad at his friends, his brothers and sisters for saying nothing. They were responsible. They saw it. They did nothing about it. You know, they boasted that they were such an accepting, uh, non-judgmental spiritual community. Paul said, that's not good. Sin is going to spread like yeast in your community. It's going to mess people up and cost them their salvation. And then Paul goes on to explain this tension. When do you say something? And I think this is vital. Verse 12, 1 Corinthians 5. Paul asks, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? His assumption not my business, not my responsibility. He continues, are you, Corinthians, not to judge those who are inside? The implication, yes, you should. That is your responsibility. He concludes, God will judge those outside, but you expel the wicked person from among you. So the Bible makes this clear distinction. It's not my job to go down the street, to stand on the corner of First and Main and tell the whole world about its sin. God will take care of that. These people don't claim to be following Jesus. Let's not be shocked that they don't behave like they're following Jesus. What our responsibility is, is for those who are inside the church, for those who claim to be followers of Christ, to say something. Followers of Jesus are repentant and trusting in the gospel. They can't live in sin or continue in it. That would prove they don't really have faith or the Holy Spirit in their hearts. So we should say something that's a red flag, that maybe this isn't one of us, a person who loves and is living in sin. If you want more details, go to Matthew chapter 18. That's where Jesus says, if your brother sins or your sister sins, you know, fellow Christian sins, go and say something. It's your responsibility. 
Don't say, oh, I'm just going to be a loving, supportive friend. No, go say something just between the two of you. Don't embarrass them. Don't make a scene. Don't type something on social media. Just between the two of you, see if you can win them over to repentance. Problem solved. And if they don't listen, well, Jesus gives additional steps. So here's my summary answer from the Bible to that question. Are you responsible, let's say, for your daughter's sin? Well, my first question would be, does she claim to be a Christian? If she's living with her boyfriend, sleeping with her boyfriend, acting like marriage doesn't matter, breaking uh, what the Bible says in Hebrews 13 verse 4 about the marriage bed. If she claims to be a Christian, I'm fine, mom, I, I still have faith. Well then, yes, 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 please say something. And I would also add, you know, people sin, but they're often repentant. If a person is struggling with a sin and they know it, you, you don't have to pounce on every single opportunity. I think where we really should be concerned and feel responsible is where someone sins and there is no evidence of sorrow. You know, if I'm the pastor who gets really angry at a meeting, but I come back the next day or send the email, hey, everyone, I'm sorry for losing my cool. You don't have to confront me about that. I'm repentant. But if you see a pattern of behavior in me and I don't seem to take it seriously, then yes, please, 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 as the Bible says, are you not to judge those inside? Yes, you should. This is messy. And uh, I don't think many of us in the modern church have developed these muscles. Uh, we've been trained to maybe take the more compassionate, patient route. I'll leave that between you and God. But that's not at all what Paul did or what Jesus did or the apostles did or the prophets did or the Bible does. There's a spot with an open book to correct, to confront, to rebuke for the sake of a person's relationship with God. Are you responsible? Maybe. Read Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 5 and God will give you most of the answers that you need. Are there only certain reasons in the Bible that are valid for a Christian to get divorced? Um, someone once told me that when someone asks you a question, you have to remember who is asking the question. Now, this particular question came in anonymously during our church's Q&A Sunday, but I, I really wish I could see the person who asked it because if it's not just a you know, theological, technical, what does the Bible say, but if it's personal, it is so emotional. You know, I've had some ups and downs in marriage, but I haven't had like really down downs that made me think of divorce. And I can only, I can only imagine if you've been there, if you're profoundly unhappy, if being in the same room as your spouse does not bring you joy, but just the opposite, if, if their presence, it doesn't make you feel comforted, but it's just constant conflict. If kids are caught in the middle, like the thought of, Living with that for another month or another year or another decade or a half of a lifetime. I mean, I get why people wonder, even Christian people wonder, what, what are the reasons that God would give me to get out of this marriage? Oh, it's, it's actually not a, a new debate. Did you know 2,000 years ago, right in the days of Jesus, there were two major schools of thought from two very popular Jewish rabbis, one named Hillel and the other named Shammai. Um, you can Google some of this background. Uh, Hillel said that a man could divorce his wife, a marriage could end really for any reason. Uh, I believe this is true, but you should fact check me on this. I think he said even if your wife like burns dinner, that's a valid cause in the eyes of God for divorce. So, I mean, literally, if you're not happy, go. Separate, God is okay with it. Uh, but Shammai was much more conservative. He said, no, 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 the Old Testament doesn't allow any reason. God brings two people together into one marriage. He makes them one flesh. You shouldn't tear that apart unless, unless in the case of sexual immorality. If your husband cheats on you, he's really broken the marriage bond. You don't have to, but you could leave. That'd be a valid reason in the eyes of God. And Hillel and Shammai debated back and forth. People picked this side or that side. And then one day someone came to Jesus in Matthew 19. And they said, Jesus, what do you think? Can a man divorce his wife for any reason? Pick a side, Jesus. So do you remember what Jesus said? He went back to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 2. That in the beginning, God made man and a woman. He brought them together and the two became one flesh. And Jesus says, what God has brought together, let man not separate. 
Jesus in that teaching of Matthew 19, I believe also in Matthew chapter 5, said in cases of sexual immorality of adultery, someone could leave. That would be a valid reason. If the trust is gone, if you can't rebuild it and make it work because of their sin, you could go and God would not be mad. In addition, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, the Apostle Paul has a very, very long chapter on married life, on singleness, and on divorce. And he talks about this in the early ver- verses that um, you really should stay together as God intended you to unless your spouse deserts you. He talks about such circumstances where someone just leaves. He says in verse 15, if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister, the Christian, in such cir- is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. So if a person just bails on the vow that they made, they could physically leave or you could have a circumstance where they just have zero desire. They're not repentant. They're like, it says, an unbeliever. They're not trying to love you. It's just done. Like it's a really kind of nuanced situation. But there are cases, the Apostle Paul said, that they could cheat or they could just bail. They could leave you high and dry and you are not bound in such circumstances. And we also can think, uh, as many Christians have said, cases of abuse. You know, if there's danger and God wants you to protect your children or to be physically safe and, and you can't do that while here in this house, well then, man, that's a great reason too. Now, I've learned as a pastor over 15 years that these are really nuanced cases. Some people feel like their spouse isn't keeping their vow. But when I dig a little bit deeper, I find out that neither are they. And the answer isn't divorce. The answer is repentance on both sides and reconciliation. I've also met people who feel like God says they have to stay when there's reasons that they don't have to stay. So my my encouragement to all of you would be to reach out to a pastor who loves you and loves the Bible. Who's going to give you, when they hear your story, the most objective biblical answer that they can. Sometimes we ache just like the people who followed Hillel for a reason to leave and we need to be told to stay. And sometimes people forget that Jesus and Paul said there there might be reasons to go. God isn't mad if you're a divorced woman or man. Oh man, I I know lots of you are divorced. There's so much more to say about this topic. God's grace, forgiveness, remarriage, the things that Jesus taught. But I'll, I'll stick to the simple question. Are there valid reasons in the Bible for divorce? A few. Not any reason, not every reason, but a few reasons where God would let you go. May he give us wisdom and trust as we follow his path. How can pastors say at funerals, they're in heaven now? Someone asked that really insightful question at our church's annual Q&A Sunday. How can we say that. We can't see into people's hearts. How can you know for sure where a person goes after they die? I thought as a pastor, I've said that a lot. (laughs) I've rarely gone to a Christian funeral and shrugged. Uh, Instead, I've tried to say with confidence, she's not suffering anymore. When my wife's father, Wayne, passed away a few years ago, I I tried to look at my mother-in-law and say he's in heaven now. I looked at my wife And my sister-in-law and said, your dad is in heaven now. I looked at my own children, my niece and my nephew and said, Grandpa Wayne is in heaven now. Was I just giving them false hope? Was I over-promising? Probably not. That probably was the right thing to say. (laughs) Let me explain that by saying two things. Number one, the Bible is very, 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 very super duper competent that if you are a Christian, if you have repented of sin and trusted in Jesus, the moment you die, you get to be with God. All right, the Apostle Paul says, brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. So you got to know this. We, we don't want you to be hopeless. Verse 14, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. All right, so when Jesus comes back, God's people are going to be with him. They're in heaven with him right now. They will return one day. Uh, Jesus said to the thief on the cross in Luke chapter 23, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. 
right? He was a thief on a cross. He was a bad man. <laughs> he was a sinner. He's actually a pretty bad sinner. And yet when he turned and had faith in Jesus, there was that promise, today, heaven, paradise is yours. So we can say that everyone who is a Christian, the moment they die, they get to be with God. Read Philippians chapter one. The apostle Paul backs this up. Now, the only asterisk I would put on that statement is the the Bible is also honest that sometimes we can't see the whole story. I think it's in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus tells a little parable called the parable of the weeds and the wheat. Where, you know, this good wheat is growing up in a field, but there's some weeds growing up with it. And they kind of look similar. And the servants of the field owner want to pull up all the weeds. But the field owner says, whoa, whoa, wait, you might not always be able to tell the difference. And in Jesus' story, he's implying that at the judgment day, the angels are going to do it perfectly. These are the Christians. These are not. These people repented. These people didn't. These people look to Christ for their salvation. These people look to themselves. They're going to do it perfectly. But right now, you and I can't do it perfectly. We might assume someone's not a Christian, but maybe they have that little mustard seed of faith. Or maybe she obviously looks like a Christian, but you don't know, like the Pharisee, she's a whitewashed tomb and says the right things, but doesn't really believe in her heart. So we do need to allow that reality that we don't know 100% for sure. We can only judge based on what we see. And what I saw up close in my father-in-law was a man who, yes, sinned, but repented of his sin and found hope in Jesus. Can we say at a funeral, he's in heaven, she's in heaven? We can with confidence. We entrust the final judgment to Jesus. But right here, right now, we don't grieve like people who don't have hope, who wonder what happened. Instead, we say they confessed Christ. And based on that evidence, we know that they are with Christ in heaven. Is it a sin to be angry? Hmm. Uh, great question. Uh, many Christians will imply that getting angry or being angry is bad. God doesn't want you to be angry. But as I open the Bible, especially to Ephesians chapter 4, I don't think that's entirely true. Let me read to you verse 26. The Apostle Paul, he's unpacking the Christian life and he says, In your anger, do not sin. If my memory is right, the original Greek that Paul wrote literally said, Be angry, but don't sin. So he's making a distinction between the two. I think there's a type of anger that's not sinful, but often that type of anger leads to sin. So be angry, but don't sin. It actually makes total sense. If you would see some sin happening before your eyes and it didn't make you angry, you would be a bad person. If you could hear a news story about a country invading another country and pillaging and stealing and murdering and assaulting and, oh, okay. That would make you a bad person. The sense of justice in you should be angry like God is angry. That people are trampling on other people. That sin, that evil is taking place. That should make you angry. We should care. When children are abused, when people are trafficked, when kids are bullied in school, when families are broken apart by adults, we should be emotional about such things. Jesus was. Jesus still is. But in your anger, uh, do not sin. It's really easy when you're emotional, right? To do things that are not like Jesus. Uh, we might get super proud and think these people are the problem and we forget about that we're part of the problem. We might say things just to wound people and hurt people. We lose sight of justice really quick and we run to vengeance. And that kind of anger, the Bible says, get rid of it. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, sinful anger, brawling and slander. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Um, I, I want you to care when sin happens. I want you to care so much you do something about it, but pray to be protected from this temptation to use your emotion as an excuse to sin. 
to say something unwholesome and unhelpful just because you're fired up. And I love these final lines. Be kind and compassionate, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. God was angry at your sin. But instead of pouring out his wrath and vengeance, he sent his one and only son. In Christ, his anger was dissipated, taken care of. And in the same way as Christians, we get angry about sin, but we handle it in a very different way than this world. In your anger, do not sin. Instead, be kind, compassionate, and forgive, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Slavery is bad, but there's lots of slavery in the Bible and God doesn't do anything about it. That was the question that recently came in at our church's question and answer Sunday. And it's a good one. It's a question that I asked as I started to read through the Bible for the very first time. We know the horrors of American slavery, the plantations, the people misusing and abusing the Bible. And yet, despite what we've seen, there's all kinds of mentions of slavery, Old Testament and new in this book, and God rarely seems to like flat out condemn it. So what's up with that? How can God be good if he turns a blind eye to slavery, which is so, so bad? Now, I thought about this question. I recently watched a movie starring Will Smith. Uh, it's a story of that uh, classic picture. I'm not sure if you've seen it of a slave named Gordon, an enslaved man named Gordon with just almost unbelievable scars down his back from where he was whipped. That picture, and you can Google it, is such a stark reminder of the horrors and the evil and the sinfulness of slavery. So how, 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 how can this be in this supposedly good book? Well, if you're the person who asked me this question, why doesn't God do anything about it? I would say you're, you're only about 25% right. Are there plenty of instances of slavery in this book? Yes. In fact, the New Testament book of Philemon is the Apostle Paul writing to a slave master about one of his runaway slaves. About half of the book of Exodus is about God's people enslaved in Egypt and he releases them from their master, a a very malicious man named Pharaoh. So true, there's lots of slavery in all different parts of the Bible. But here's what you should probably know. Uh, Many cases of slavery in the Bible are not at all like the slavery that happened here in America. Some people were taken slaves as captives of war. Uh, Others actually sold themselves into slavery to pay off debts. Uh, If my research is right, I think up to one half of major cities in the ancient world, like Corinth or Athens, were filled with slaves because a musician would have been a slave and a, a teacher would have been a slave. Uh, This relationship where, you know, you're going to take care of my physical needs and I'm going to work for you, uh, much of that fell under the umbrella of slavery in the ancient world. So you have to remember slavery that we think of wasn't exactly slavery like they thought of. We might think of a a boss and an employee, like I'm enslaved to this nine to five job. I I have to come, not of my own free will, because you're paying me, you're taking care of me. That's almost in some instances a form of ancient slavery. So we can't deny some of it was wicked and evil and destructive and abusive, but also some of it was not. But that last line from the question, God doesn't do anything about it, just isn't biblically true. If you read the book of Exodus, for example, in their pain and misery, the slaves of Egypt cried out to God and he heard them and he rescued them. The word Exodus literally means a road out of. They exited Egypt because God was against that abusive, horrific slavery. Or think about this. In the book of Philemon, just one page in my Bible, one chapter, the Apostle Paul is writing uh, to this man named Philemon. He was a slave owner about this runaway slave named Onesimus. Onesimus had run to Paul and now Paul was going to send the slave back to his master. And listen to what he said to his master. Perhaps the reason Onesimus was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Oh, forever slavery, that sounds bad. No, keep reading. You might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. 
doesn't quite fit the narrative of <laughs> race-based slavery, does it? If teachings like that from the Bible were really what undid the whole system, once the impoverished were raised up by Jesus, once slave and master found equal identity at the cross, once humility got the last word and money mattered very little, once biblical principles took root, uh, slavery couldn't last forever. So, that question, is there slavery in the Bible? There is. Is it the same as the slavery we instinctively think of? Uh, often not. Does God do anything about it? Uh, ask the people of Egypt in the days of Moses. Ask Philemon and Onesimus and Paul. God and his love does much about it. I hope that helps you remember and not lose your faith when you find slavery in the Bible.